So could you please tell us about who you are? Yeah, uh, so I'm Haytham Taha. I was uh, born and raised in uh, Cairo, Egypt. I got my bachelor and master in aerospace engineering from uh, Cairo University. Then I moved to the United States around 2010. So this was 11 years ago to start my PhD uh, at Virginia Tech, where I got uh, my PhD from uh, engineering science and mechanics department, simultaneously with a master degree in mathematics. My PhD was about uh, insect flight dynamics. And uh, I was lucky enough that after my graduation, I got an offer from uh, mechanical and aerospace engineering department here at University of California, Irvine, to start as an assistant professor. And this is the place where I'm currently working at as an associate professor. Luckily, I got my tenure last year. And I am married and having uh, three beautiful daughters. Congratulations. Thank you. Right. So why did you want to become an aerospace engineer? Um, I was naive back then, frankly speaking, in the sense that, uh, you know, I didn't really know what aerospace engineering is about. So I, I, I chose based on the prestige. It's really cool to have aerospace engineering title in, in, inside your name. But um, I, it wasn't only prestige. I, it, it also matched my passion about math, physics, and mechanics. So, right. And could you talk about the research that you're currently conducting, conducting in aeronautics and dynamics and control laboratory? Yeah. Um, so we mainly have two, two main pillars in our research group theoretical fluid mechanics from one side or aerodynamics. From the other side, dynamics and control, dynamical systems and how we control them, how we understand their behavior. These are the two main foundations. And then we, we blend these two branches and apply them to unconventional flight concepts. Something like micro air vehicles that fly like insects. For example, this is an, you know, an unconventional flying concept. Basically any, any flying object that flies differently from the classical aeroplane. We're interested in it and we were doing research on it. Mm -hmm. but what is the geometric nonlinear control theory and what are its applications in aerospace engineering? Yeah, that, that's a tough question to answer in simple terms, but, but let me try. Um, so geometric control theory, a hand wavy definition for geometric control theory is simply the control theory, the, the well-known control theory, plus or intersected with a branch from mathematics called differential geometry. Differential geometry is a branch of mathematics that is concerned with calculus on curvy spaces. So it's so because everybody knows that Einstein relativity has to do with curvature of space-time. So they used lots of differential geometry there. All right. So. Uh, Practically, uh, I mean, for how an engineer should think about it is, is the following. So uh, usually we engineers uh, or even human beings, we don't like to see nonlinearity, nonlinear behaviors. We like to see linear behavior. So formally speaking, engineers, even when we see nonlinear systems, we linearize them. We approximate them by linear systems because it's easier to study and understand and control these linear systems. So we tend to view nonlinearity as bad things that we we tend to get rid of. Interestingly, geometric control theory allows us to exploit nonlinearity to our own advantage to achieve motion that cannot be achieved using the linear control. So one can manipulate two control inputs in, a, in an interesting way, non-intuitive way to generate motion in a new direction that we could not generate motion along in either one of the two linear controls. Applying it on aerospace, um, so let me say, so geometric control theory actually is, uh, is well known among roboticists and robotics community. It is much less known in the aeronautical engineering community. I would take the honor that our research group is among the first or if not the first group to genu genuinely apply geometric control theory to aeronautical engineering. Let me give you an example. So probably you have heard about something called stall, stall phenomenon for air, airplanes. So if, if an airplane, uh, in, becomes, you know, has a, has a relatively large angle with the surrounding air. I mean, relatively large, like 15 degrees or something. Uh, a serious phenomenon takes place. It's called stall. 
where the lift on the airplane, the lift force actually stalls, drops significantly, but more serious, the pilot loses control. And actually loss of control has been number one reason for fatal accidents worldwide over the last 10 years. And for small airplanes, this, this number statistics becomes scary. So we lose one airplane every three days because of loss of control. Small airplane, I mean, one of these small airplanes. All right, so uh, the, the, the dynamics of the airplane in this regime is highly nonlinear. So, and what we lose actually is the linear control. So what we found in our group is that we can um, manipulate the control stick of the pilot in a weird way suggested by geometric control theory that allows us to exploit the nonlinearity in this regime. And the result is enhancement of the airplane control authority and maneuverability 10 times, which is you know, a crazy number, unprecedented number. Uh, we actually find the patent in this technology. If successful, it would save many airplanes. Mm -hmm. And what is the significance of unsteady aerodynamics in aerospace engineering? Yeah, good question. So uh, most of the unconventional flying concepts like, um, you know, insects, birds, or even helicopters, they, they um, experience some unsteady phenomena. But even the classical airplanes, there is a, a famous phenomenon uh, for, for classical airplanes called flutter. So beyond a certain speed of the airplane, the wing naturally starts to flap, which is, uh, you know, uh, very serious because, I mean, it, it will break eventually. So uh, engineers must, you know, study this phenomenon in, in, in detail and, and uh, make sure that this speed is so high, so far from the airplane operating condition. And obviously this phenomenon with continuous oscillation of the wing is an unsteady phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And you know, aerospace engineering, as the name suggests, it's an engineering uh, branch and it requires high levels of math. And so how often is calculus using your optimal control research? Uh, almost always. <laughs> so let me, man, I, I can't imagine how, how we would do this research or any research in our lab without, without high level of math. I mean, um, so let me give you an interesting example. So um, over the last 20 years, uh, scientists thought that insects are unstable during hovering over a flower. What this means is, um, you know, if, if I have an inverted pendulum, for example, it's barely at that position. If you just touch it, it will fall down. It will never come back to its original position. This is what we mean by unstable. And, and the opposite is, is stable. So at the down position for the, for the pendulum, it's stable. If you just push it, it will oscillate a little bit and then eventually come back to its original position. So this is what we mean by stable and unstable. So, uh, Classical airplanes, like the one we, we, we ride all the time, these are, luckily, they are stable. So if, if, if the air touches them, you know, or disturbs them, it, they will eventually come back, even without the interference of the pilot or autopilot. This is naturally, natural stability. So the conclusion by scientists over the last 20 years is that insects are unstable. They, couldn't, they could not explain how insects stabilize themselves during hovering over a flower. The issue is that insects dynamics is different from the classical airplanes because the insects dynamics is time varying because of this continuous vibration of the wing it makes the dynamics time varying. So uh, we were we were reading about time varying dynamical systems and we found a, a paper by Russian mathematicians in the 70s and uh, it's they developed a new calculus called chronological calculus. This calculus is specific for time varying dynamical systems. It was quite difficult paper to read like any math paper, but so, so my, my master in mathematics was really essential to, in order even to understand just the content of the paper. But then when we applied their advanced math tools, we found a very interesting phenomenon that actually the natural vibration of the insect's wing naturally stabilized the flight dynamics of the insect through a, a, a phenomenon called vibrational stabilization or stabilization through vibration. If you have an unstable and you vibrate it, it becomes naturally stable. So the inverted pendulum that we talked about, if you vibrate it up and down by a motor and you push it, you will find it, it looks like magic. It will come back actually to its 
position, original position. When we build it in the lab, it looks really like magic. And, and uh, what we found is that insects exploit the same phenomenon. The calculus that we used was an essential step to, to prove this result and, and, uh, and uh, verified experimentally afterwards. We published the result in Science Robotics and made a, a big splash, you know, correcting the, the accepted wisdom in the community that prevailed over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, you also do extensive work on autopilots. So could you explain some of the process that is involved in creating an autopilot? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So actually, the, the, I mean, related to the geometric control theory, for example, the patent that we filed, we, we actually filed a patent on designing an autopilot uh, that, you know, continuously measuring the angle of the, of the airplane with the surrounding air, what we call the angle of attack. And if it exceeds a certain threshold beyond which we, the pilot will lose the linear control, then the autopilot will kick in and applies this weird nonlinear control suggested by the geometric control theory to execute the pilot command or to stabilize the airplane. So this is one of the autopilots that we're developing in the lab. Mm -hmm. So what has been your toughest accomplishment so far in your career? Um, I think the, the, the national, the, what, what is called the career award granted from the National Science Foundation. This was my, my toughest thing. Um, and I would say also that the paper that we published in Science Robotics about the vibrational stabilization of insect flight, this was very hard to sell because it, uh, it contradicts the accepted wisdom in the community for 20 years. So it wasn't an easy sell. <laughs> And what is a big milestone that you're looking forward to in your research? That's a very good question. I'm super excited about the coming milestone because, you know, if, if we say that uh, uh, maybe we corrected or, or, you know, adjusted the accepted wisdom in the community about insect flapping flight or insect stability that lasted over 20 years, we're actually going uh, way more back now almost at the very beginning of the development of the theory of flight. So a century ago, and we're developing a new theory of flight that also happened to correct some of the uh, misconceptions about lift generation over a wing that prevailed over a century. The new theory, we're, we're, we're very excited about the new theory because it's uh, unlike the current theory, the classical theory of flight, this new theory is actually um, derived from first principles. And these principles were buried uh, in the history of mechanics. Basically, they have gone into oblivion. It's just when we have read the history of mechanics, we found about these forgotten principles. When we apply them, we managed to develop a new theory of flight. And regarding your question about calculus, actually, it involves calculus. The new theory is based on the idea that nature is minimizing a certain magic quantity in every flow over a wing. And we found that this magic quantity is the curvature. So if you want to know how much lift is generated, just get the curvature over the wing and minimize it. So we do calculus to minimize. So we get the lift. Uh, so, so this is, it's, it's under review now. We're, we're super excited to know about, you know, it's a review process very soon. Mm -hmm. And to high schoolers like me and to younger generations that want to become aerospace engineers, what would be your advice to be successful in this career? That's a tough question, but, uh, and also I, I hate to sound cliche, but I would say cliche stuff also. <laughs> I mean, I would, you know, um, I would always follow my passion. This is my advice because some people, they, they choose based on the ease criterion, you know, whatever the easy route will go with it. Well, the route with passion will be more enjoyable, of course, because it, it's associated with passion. And some other people, they choose uh, based on the money, you know, uh, whatever route will, will pay more, I will go with it. Well, if you choose the, the route with passion, you will excel because you, I mean, whenever you have passion, you will excel. And when you excel, your expertise becomes so expensive. Ex expensive. So people will pay you much more because of your unique experience if, if you excel. So... Passion is the key to me. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks for joining me and thanks for letting me interview you. That was great.
Thank you, Balamir. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity.